Recent studies confirm what many patients with disabilities already know, and that is disability bias continues to persist in healthcare settings. Just over 61 million Americans have disabilities, and increasing evidence documents that they experience healthcare disparities. Although many factors likely contribute to these disparities, one potential cause involves healthcare providers' perceptions of people with disabilities. For example, in a recent study conducted by Lisa Iazzoni and her colleagues, they surveyed over 700 practicing physicians across the United States. Researchers found that 82% of those physicians reported that people with disabilities had a lower quality of life than those without disabilities. Shockingly, only 40% of those physicians reported feeling very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care to disabled patients as they do to non-disabled patients. And only 56% strongly agreed that they welcomed patients with disability into their practices. More than 30 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was enacted, these findings about physicians' perceptions of this population raise questions about ensuring equitable access to health care for disabled people. Potentially biased views among physicians could contribute to persistent health care disparities affecting disabled Americans today. You might be thinking to yourself, I work with well-trained professionals. We don't have biases against disabled people. But remember, we have all been exposed to bias, and there are two ways that it shows up. We have explicit bias and implicit bias. All of our lives, we've been exposed to negative stereotypes, assumptions, falsehoods about people with disabilities, like that life just isn't as good or as satisfying if you're disabled. These messages swirl around us in the language that we hear used, in the TV and movies that we watch. We are always surrounded by these ideas in our social media. And over time, we absorb these negative messages in ways that we're often completely unaware. That is, such attitudes can be conscious or explicit or unconscious and implicit. Think of bias like an iceberg. If you imagine the water in which an iceberg floats is that line of consciousness, the part of the iceberg above the water represents the attitudes, the assumptions, the thoughts of which we're consciously aware, that is, our explicit biases. We're aware of these attitudes in ourselves. We can even report them in things like surveys, questionnaires, and interviews. The unseen part of the iceberg below the waterline, that is again a line of consciousness, there lies our implicit biases, which we may not even be aware of. But just because we're not conscious of these biases does not mean that they do not still influence our behaviors and our decisions. Studies examining explicit and implicit bias among healthcare providers show that disability bias persists on both levels across healthcare professions. So how do we begin to tackle dismantling disability bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious? Well, one place to start is by shifting our understanding of disability to a perspective that highlights the diversity of the human experience. Understanding disability from a diversity perspective comes from the field of scholarship called disability studies. And one of the things to understand about disability studies is that we take as our starting point of inquiry not the limitations of bodies or minds, but instead shifting our focus to the ways that we have intentionally designed our built and social environments to cater to the needs and preferences of one way of being or one way of thinking. When we assume that there is only one way of functioning in the world, that erects barriers for those who don't fit into that archetype of always young, always healthy, always perfectly functioning. The reason we want to introduce the field of disability studies is to acknowledge that there are lots of models of disability out there today, but we can abstractly categorize different models and definitions into two broad frameworks. In the United States, we're all socialized into a deficit framework or perspective of disability. Key aspects of thinking about disability from a deficit perspective is that any kind of variation from what is considered typical is bad. 
And note that bad is a value judgment. In this logic, society should then seek to minimize that bad variation within its members. And so disability, from this perspective, is seen as a trait or an attribute of an individual and therefore is not contextual. So let's contrast that with a framework for understanding disability as part of the diversity of human experience, arguing that difference, well, is just difference, whether that's difference in a way a person communicates, moves, thinks, senses visual or auditory input. Again, it's just different. Not better, not worse than the way that someone else communicates, moves, thinks, senses visual or auditory input. So from a diversity perspective, variation from the typical is natural. And in fact, diversity is valuable. So if society is going to intervene, it should seek to enable all of its members to participate to the maximum of their capacity. And in this framework, disability is not a trait or an attribute of an individual, but rather disability is a socially constructed status. A diversity perspective defines disability as an interaction between one's way of functioning and the built and social environment in which they find themselves. So individuals may have non-typical or even impaired functioning, but it's societal barriers that disable individuals. Impairment is generally defined as a non-typical way or degree of functioning, and that includes physical, mental, emotional, or psychosocial modes. And this brings us to understanding and defining ableism, a set of assumptions and practices that promote the differential or unequal treatment of people because of actual or even presumed body or mind differences. And if this definition seems very familiar to you, it is probably because this is the definition that is embedded in our disability civil rights laws. The ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. This includes people who have a record of such impairment, even if they don't currently have a disability. It also includes individuals who don't have a disability themselves, but are regarded as having a disability. The ADA goes as far as to also make it unlawful to discriminate against a person based on that person's association with a person with a disability, such as a parent or caregiver. There is a reason why the ADA talks specifically about impairments and about the social stigma that has historically been associated with disability. It is because the ADA is shaped by a diversity perspective of disability. This is a law intended to prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities, aiming to help reduce disparities in social outcomes, such as disparities in health outcomes. So what can we do to not just comply with this law, but to be allies to our disabled friends, family members, colleagues, and patients in our clinical and healthcare spaces? Probably one of the most effective things you can do is to establish institution-wide or even practice-wide standards of care for people with disabilities. Being an ally means thinking through and setting or creating internal standards that outline policies and practices around treating patients with disabilities. Such standards address issues specific to your practice and patients, but might include answers to questions like, at what point in the scheduling, intake, or exam processes are patients prompted to request accommodations? When is it clinically appropriate to treat a person with disabilities in their wheelchair versus treating them on an exam table? How will you schedule and bill for the extra time that may be required to accommodate a disabled patient. Time that's associated with having an interpreter present, making transfers from wheelchairs to exam equipment, or the time it may take to provide aftercare instructions in plain language that a patient with a cognitive or intellectual disability can understand them. These decisions, or the lack of them, all combine to inform clinical decisions. There are other ways to practice disability allyship at the institutional level of your healthcare practice. 
Start by taking an inventory of what your institution is actively doing to address bias and promote inclusion for all marginalized groups. Assess how that's being accomplished or what is missing. We see more and more diversity, equity, and inclusion work being implemented in healthcare spaces. But these trainings still often leave out disability when discussing and developing identity-specific competencies. For example, do you have a multiracial, diverse team of disabled staff and advisory board? If not, develop connections with them and evaluate your hiring practices. As educated professionals, use your sway within your institution to implement hiring practices aimed at increasing diversity. Use your influence to help your profession or your professional organizations take positions of inclusion and push for anti-ableist policies. You may feel like you're in a position that maybe you don't have the power to steer the organization or even the practice of which you're part of. But there are many things you can do as an individual to demonstrate allyship to your disabled colleagues and patients. Start and end each visit with an access check-in. Begin each visit by asking, do you have any accommodation needs that we should talk about before we begin to make sure we get the most out of your visit today? Don't make assumptions about the priorities of your disabled patients. Ask them what they want to address during the visit. And always, listen, ask questions, double check for comprehension of what's being discussed. Another way to practice allyship is to be aware of bias in the language that we use. Ableism or disability bias is so embedded in our culture that it shows up in many of the common phrases or the everyday language we use. Be aware of ableism in your charting or when you're taking medical notes. So for example, avoid language that insinuates that disability is a tragedy. So this is language like being, quote, confined to a wheelchair, being bedridden, saying that someone suffers from or is afflicted with a particular condition. Avoid language that minimizes or diminishes psychosocial disabilities. So for example, avoid saying things like, my schedule is insane, or I am so OCD today, or someone needs to take their meds. Instead, use descriptive language rather than value-laden language when you're charting or making exam notes. So think about what does it mean to say a patient is non-compliant, aggressive, disengaged, has poor hygiene. So rather than use these vague terms, describe behavior, action, or appearance in neutral terms. Inquire how disability might impact experience and or treatment of a focal health concern. Note that if a patient spits or bites, these are definitely important things to note for yourself and other providers. But in these cases, it's even more important to be specific and describe the behavior rather than using a vague value-based description such as aggressive. Another way that you can be an ally to disabled patients is to consider the accessibility of all areas of your practice in which your patients will be. Think about, are there seats that will work for people of all body types and sizes? Is the waiting room arranged in a way that will accommodate power wheelchairs? Is there somewhere for a person who uses a cane to position that cane while they check in? Will elevators accommodate power wheelchairs? Is there parking space for a vehicle with a ramp or a lift? Is there a relief area for service animals? One of the most important things you can do to be an ally to people with disabilities is to keep learning. Watching this short video is one such way to learn about the Americans with Disabilities Act and healthcare. And we hope that you will keep learning with us.